in our country, the UK, something extraordinary is happening as well. We're on the brink of electing a globalist politician, a the head and leader of the Labour Party, who has extraordinary CIA links and is a self-declared globalist and advocate for Davos. Meanwhile, a last minute surge from my own literal on air sparring partner, Nigel Farage, means that a right wing populist movement called Reform will likely make significant gains in the next election. Nigel Farage, is he the British Trump? And could he create a Trump like surprise? usurping the presumed next elected Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, a man who has CIA links and is an advocate for globalism. Let's get into it. First of all, let's have a look at Nigel Farage. Now, I've known Nigel Farage for a while. I've been on Question Time with Nigel Farage. I uh, called him a pound shop Enoch Powell. He is a pound shop Enoch Powell and we got to watch him. It was a this Enoch Powell was a sort of a popular right wing politician who talked about the threat, as he described it, of immigration in the 70s and 80s. The argument around immigration continues, but more and more, you can see that people are concerned about sovereignty, national control and borders because, well, for a number of reasons, but mostly, I suppose, what it does to the job market. In your country, a lot of people think it's used to alter demographics and alter votes. There's a lot to talk about on the subject of immigration. There certainly is. Whatever the reason for liberalism affording open and borders, I'm increasingly sceptical about it being compassion and duty and care because I don't see a lot of compassion, duty and care in the way that neoliberalists run the world right now. Let's have a look at Nigel Farage. Is he the British Trump? And what does it mean for Britain if Keir Starmer, a kind of devout and overt globalist, is elected? Let's get into it. Nigel Farage. My question is to Penny Morden. Given that your 2010 manifesto, your 2015 manifesto, your 2017 manifesto said you'd reduce net migration to tens of thousands, your 2019 manifesto said immigration would massively reduce, and that net 4.3 million people have come into the country since that time, why on earth should anybody believe the fifth manifesto that promises cuts to net migration? Because of the record of this Prime Minister. So we've had... <laughs> People laughed out loud because Rishi Sunak, another globalist whose father-in-law owns Infosys, which sponsors the WF, which many people say has significant contracts with the UK on a variety of tech matters, is a laughing stock. He was like the third unelected prime minister we had in this country. They kept just coming up with them out of... Thin air, almost. Uh, Boris Johnson recently was Prime Minister. You will know potentially in the United States as the man that derailed the Zelensky Putin peace deal after being instructed by, well, maybe globalist Diddy style handlers. I don't know who ultimately controls these things. Here's. Nigel Farage giving a speech in the constituency, that's the territory that he's standing in, the rather unglamorous Clacton, a seaside town in Essex where I used to go on holiday as a boy that has a blue collar community that are highly likely to elect Nigel Farage, making him the sort of de facto leader of the opposition and a step closer to being the British Trump. In the last two years, two and a half million new people have come to our country. Think of it, one in 30 people in this country today has come in the last two years. Britain needs reform. Nothing works anymore. How are you getting on folks for GP appointments? What I think is amazing when you see in British politics is it seems so parochial and local. I can never imagine seeing Donald Trump talking about how you're getting on seeing a GP, which is our uh, synecdoche for doctor, our phrase at least for doctor, a local family doctor. And Nigel Farage is offering the idea that the reason you can't see GPs is because of population explosion.
Certainly, he is resonating with his audience down there in Clacton, even if British politics seems somehow a lot less glamorous than American politics. But hey, glamour, is that the answer? Has it ever been? And what would a British Donald Trump look like? I get the feeling he would be wearing a brass buttoned blazer. And potentially what we're about to see is, if not the election of Nigel Farage, the ascent of Nigel Farage to the de facto leader of the opposition because the Tory party, our version of the Republican party, is imploding and shattered and scattered and justifiably so because it was a corrupt little organisation that was crap. The problem is that the Labour Party is ultimately the same thing with a slightly different veneer. Like with many politicians in your country, you could move them around throughout the parties, ultimately knowing that the same corporatist globalist interests will ultimately remain in control. You're still going to have war between Russia and Ukraine. You're still going to escalate tensions globally. You're still not going to advocate for peace across the Middle East in any meaningful and significant way. And you are still ultimately going to put powerful interests ahead of the interests of ordinary people, the very people that have voted for you. How do we know this? Well, for a start, Keir Starmer says that his allegiance will be to Davos rather than Westminster. That's our Congress. He also has weird links to the CIA and he's a lawyer. And when he was a practicing institutional lawyer within our country with a remit of controlling legal cases across all of London, he made some extraordinary decisions, which we'll touch on in a moment. First of all, though, let's uh, have a look at Keir Starmer's peculiar relationship with the CIA. Keir Starmer joined an international grouping closely linked to the US and UK intelligence intelligence services while serving in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet. For a minute, the Labour Party was run by a Bernie Sanders style politician that was anti-establishment. Remember, as Steve Bannon said, there will be a resurgence of populism. He didn't know, he said, Bannon, a couple of years ago, whether it will be left wing or right wing populism. But people are so sick and tired of corrupt, systemic, institutional increasingly authoritarian and hypocritical governments that they're going to look for a populist response to the establishment. As you know, we can't make this content without the support of our sponsors. Here's a message from them now. Fume! Flavoured air is becoming the leading alternative to vaping and smoking, a movement towards better habits from today's sponsor, Fume. The alternative, this alternative, helps you kick your bad habit in an enjoyable way. Fume is an award-winning device with no batteries, no charging, looks awesome. Feel the weighted quality and the high quality design. It's made to fidget with, to calm anxiety. Spin your fume device on this base. We're not using it. Look at that. Ah, oh, the earth spins on its axis. One man troubles and another relaxes. Be their next success story. For a limited time, you can use my code Russell Brand to get your free fume base when you order the journey pack. Head to trifume.com. That's trifum.com. Use the code Russell Brand or scan the QR code on the screen to get your free fume base when you order your journey pack today. Ah, life is a journey. A journey full of delicious fume. And when I'm not sucking on that thing, by God, I'll spin it. Sucking and spinning. Relaxing, anxiety releasing and reducing. Magnificent. What an incredible salute. Get back here. I can't live without that thing. Click the link in the description. And remember, try the QR code on your screen to get your free fume base. I mean, this thing's quite good. This can save you quite a lot of trouble. Use the code Russell Brand to get your free fume base. Now back to the content. Thank you, Fume, for sponsoring this video. In the UK, for a minute, Jeremy Corbyn looked like he was going to benefit from that energy and looked like he was leading a Labour movement that could meaningfully impact the interests of the powerful. Keir Starmer was a member of the Shadow Cabinet, the opposition cabinet at that time, and he took odd meetings with US and UK intelligence services. The Trilateral Commission, that's the name of this sort of cabal of intelligence services, describes itself as a global membership organisation which seeks to discuss and propose solutions to some of the world's toughest problems. Discuss and propose solutions to some of the world's toughest problems. Its meetings are strictly off the record. It was founded by a billionaire banker, David Rockefeller, as a networking group for elites from the US, Europe and Japan. Rockefeller was close to the leadership of the CIA at the time. In a sense, these are the kind of organisations that it seems to me wield incredible power 
never having to suffer the indignity of standing before an electorate, whether it's an organisation set up by Rockefeller or a charity or philanthropic organisation set up by Gates or the Clintons or whatever, or groups like NATO or the WHO. There seems to be a number of ways where bureaucracy can bypass the will of the people. And indeed, as we saw yesterday with NATO's Trump proofing of funding to Ukraine, even in the event that a popular leader rises up that is opposed to some of their agenda, they find ways to control and curtail that. Indeed, the control of the social media and online space is about ensuring that movements like the ones that could emerge from spaces such as this never get off the ground. That's why you have to smear dissenters, create confusion, have no real ethical principles or real positions over in China. Yeah, the vaccines, uh, they're bad for you. Don't take them. In the US, if you say the vaccines are bad, you're basically going to prison. You're certainly not leaving your house. You're going to be essentially under house arrest. Starmer, this is the presumed next leader of the United Kingdom, was a member of the Trilateral Commission alongside of two former heads of the CIA and spoke at one of its London events alongside the former heads of MI5 and GCHQ, which is another deep state service in our country. Former CIA director Mike Pompeo said, we will do our level best to stop Corbyn getting elected. There is a globalist agenda. It is by using the deep state that they ensure that electoral processes or even the kind of chaos that can emerge when people are largely dissatisfied is mitigated, controlled, dampened down. You'll notice a few things. When the establishment has decided who the next leader is, they start to sort of publicly support them. You'll see stories like this. A former major conservative donor has announced he will be voting Labour for the first time, describing Rishi Sunak as an absolute dud. Founder of Phones for You, John Colwell, said the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, really hits the spot with a lot of issues with me. Right, so we're seeing billionaires move over. Have a look at this. This is when The Sun started to support Tony Blair. This was a comparable moment. This is when we knew that it doesn't matter which party you vote for, you're getting the same interest because, of course, what this was was an indication of Tony Blair's deep relationships with Rupert Murdoch. But it was included, actually, being godfather to one of his children. And some people will say that the relationships went a little further than that. But we'll wait for further corroboration before getting into it. Now, this is how Keir Starmer handled the riots that broke out in the UK after a man died in police custody. You know this is a pretty common story in your country, but it happens here too. So a young black man, Mark Duggan, I think was his name, died in police custody. It led to riots in London. And then what was really curious about it is riots started springing up in cities everywhere. What I think is extraordinary about that is it shows that there is a deep dissatisfaction, a sense that people want to change. This is what Keir Starmer did when he was head of the Crown Prosecution Service. Check it. The penal response to the rioters was enormous and unprecedented in a bid to ramp up the shock and awe of the criminal justice system, i.e. if you riot, if you cause trouble, you're going down. Look at what's happening with the January 6th insurrectionist protesters. Weird long prison sentences, right? It's peculiar the shock and awe of the criminal justice system. Every stage of the process has been shown to have been made more punitive and more authoritarian. The Crown Prosecution Service, led at the time by Keir Starmer, immediately relaxed the threshold used to determine whether or not to press charges. That means they just went, we're going to press charges for smaller crimes. Small crimes became criminalised. Long-standing advice that suspects under the age of 18 should not be tried for minor offences was suspended. They tried kids. Kids! Actions normally regarded as theft were treated as burglary so as to ensure maximum jail time. This is lawfare, like we're all becoming familiar with. They change it. They change the law. The law is not objective and justice isn't blind. It's just another tool of the system. And democracy is the best way to create tyranny. You have the illusion of choice, but indeed you have despotism of a kind that was unimaginable in 20th century militaristic dictatorships. Cases were pushed from the magistrates, the Crown Courts, again, amplifying the significance. That's sort of basically making something a federal crime rather than a misdemeanor. Ensuring that longer sentences were available and costing minors their right to anonymity in the press. Existing sentencing guidelines were abandoned. And despite criticisms that he was playing politics, Starmer ordered the courts to stay open 24-7 for emergency sessions. Where's the compassion and the care then? We've seen Keir Starmer turgivisate and prevaricate on the issue of gender. Is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix? 
well, it is uh, something that uh, shouldn't be said. It is not right. But is it right or is it wrong for Rosie Duffield to say only women have a cervix? Well, look, biologically, she, of course, is right. She's right. Like, unable to say, of course, we should be compassionate to people with gender identity issues, but there does seem to be a biological reality when it comes to sex at the molecular level. And instead of being able to say that, he flips and flops all over the place. But when it came to sentencing rioters who, even if it seemed like they were, you know, stealing a pair of sneakers or trainers, were ultimately expressing mass dissatisfaction with the corrupt system and brutal authoritarianism and indeed the ability of the state to kill, they open the courts round the clock. This is authoritarianism. And this is what authoritarianism looks like. These are the symptoms of it. These are its signs. These are its markers. While political pressure was undoubtedly put on the police and on the courts, many of these emergency innovations were the result of the justice system them taking the initiative. It was to borrow sociologist Carly Lighttowler's uh, and legal scholar Hannah Quirk's phrase, a moment of prosecutorial zeal and judicial abandon. Isn't it extraordinary that ideas that come from religion, like zeal, or perhaps they come from human nature, you can have that argument in your own mind, and abandon, the idea that you can just put aside who you believe yourself to be in order to embrace something more deeply, that you can have an enthusiasm, a power rush through you, a spirit that could change the world, deployed only in order to create more control, more authority, more fear. It culminated in 2,000 people facing jail terms, which were four and a half times longer than those same offences would normally warrant. That is authoritarianism. If you link authoritarianism to globalism, you have technological feudalism, tyranny, dictatorship, you tell me. But I'll show you this. This is Keir Starmer telling you where his allegiances lie. Let us just ask you quickly, you have to choose now between Davos or Westminster. Davos. Why? <laughs> because Westminster is too constrained. Um, and, you know, it's closed and we're not having meaning. Once you get out of Westminster, whether it's Davos or anywhere else, you actually engage with people um, that you can see working with in the future. Westminster is just a, a tribal shouting play. Yeah, people you could work with in the future, like Klaus Schwab, sadly he's retired, or maybe Albert Baller. Do you imagine for a moment that the election of this individual is going to lead to any kind of progress or change or benefit for ordinary people? Or is this simply a further advance of the kind of globalism that was ineptly practised by the previous government being practised now with people wearing slightly different coloured ties and inviting you to cheer and holler that democracy reigns. Well, don't shout too loudly or you might find yourself in a 24-7 court getting locked down unless you do something crazy like vote for populists. But I guess we're all too tied up in ideas like, oh, God, man, you know, but what does he mean? What does he represent? It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. So there you are. What would be a better bet for most people? Populism or authoritarianism? I don't know, but it's a question that people are asking all across the globe. Only in the UK, it looks like there's a slightly different dynamic at play and we might be moving deeper into populism. But that's just what I think. Why don't you let me know what you think in the comments and the chat, you beautiful people. Hey, this is exciting. We've got a great partner today. It's Rumble. But beyond Rumble, it's Rumble's latest venture. Let me ask you first, are you a Sleepy Joe type character with zero cognitive performance, struggling to muster focus and brain power for basic things like running the United States of America? You've got to stop drinking woke liberal coffee that hates you and your way of life and start your day by drinking Rumble's very own 1775 coffee. This is going to be the best tasting coffee you've ever had. Seriously good, ethically sourced from a family farm in the high altitude mountains of Bolivia. Not in the Bolivian lowlands run not by a family, but by a single man still living with a pet. No! Instead of waking up and drinking your big corporation owned woke ideology coffee that's probably making you sick from the pesticides it's sprayed with, try Rumbles 1775 Revolutionary Coffee. Support freedom of speech. Build a parallel economy that actually values you and loves you. My favourite? It's dark, of course. I've always found the lure of the dark. 
irresistible. I'm sorry, how can I stay mad at you? Well, you're just going to have to wait over there for a little while. Level up your morning routine with a 1775 coffee. Sleep all night knowing your hard-earned dollary dues are going towards supporting freedom-loving creators like me on Rumble. Visit 1775coffee.com now, pick up your first bag, use the code BRAND to save 10% on your first order. Oh, come on. Why choose, you know? Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.